All right. In this lecture, we will discuss the current groups and uh, well, the special cases of loop groups and um, of gauge groups. So let's take a look at what this means. Uh, so first of all, recall what is a current group. So if we have a Lie group G with Lie algebra L of G, and if K is a compact manifold, then uh, we get a canonical manifold structure on the smooth functions from K to G, and the point-wise group operations turn this into a Lie group, and this is a so-called current group. And we have gathered already some information beyond just the construction for this current group. So for example, we know that uh, the Lie algebra of the current group uh, is given by the smooth function with values in the Lie algebra and the point-wise bracket. So uh, such a Lie algebra is called a current algebra. And uh, we have some information about the Lie theory. So we can actually lift some Lie theoretic information from the target Lie group to the current group. So namely, we have seen that uh, if G, so the target Lie group is regular, so is the current group. So we can lift the regularity property of the Lie group to the current group. And if G is a locally exponential uh, Lie group, then also the current group is locally exponential. This is an exercise which uh, follows from the more involved case for the regularity. Okay, and then what we want to do in this lecture, we actually want to look at a special case uh, where the, um, smooth uh, manifold K is replaced with uh, the uh, circle in R2. And this situation is called uh, a loop group. And loop groups have been quite uh, quite well researched in the 1970s and 1980s. And uh, the an imp interesting, sorry, an interesting fact about loop groups is that we know a lot more about loop groups than about the general case of current groups. We won't have the time and opportunity to really study a lot uh, of what, of, say, for example, the associated representation theory of loop, loop groups. There are nice books just uh, dedicated to this topic. Instead, uh, okay, so let's let's first uh, have a look. And what I want to assume here always is for our convenience is that the target Lie group is finite dimensional. In the, uh, in the last or in the general section on um, current groups, we, need, we did not need to assume that the loop group, uh, or sorry, that the target of the current group is finite dimensional. It would all work equally well with an infinite dimensional target. However, here to keep the proof simple of what, uh, what I'm going to do, I want to assume that the group we are mapping into is finite dimensional and then we define the loop group and this gets another uh, well, an, another small moniker so it's lg those are just the smooth mappings from uh, the unit circle with values in g and we think of these elements as just smooth loops in the group and um, so one word of warning what one often finds in in the literature or when one just searches on the on the web for things related to loop groups um, often people mean with loop groups just the continuous functions from a circle with values in a Lie group and the point wise addition and uh, well however this is uh, uh, while while you can still construct an infinite dimension Lie group structure on this we in this lecture only care for the smooth functions. So for us, loop groups will always be smooth functions from S1 with values in G. Okay. And uh, to just give you an impression of what you can use these loop groups for. So there's a beautiful article by Karen Uhlenbeck and uh, uh, um, I forgot now the, the first name of, of uh, Mr. Tang. Uh, so there's uh, this article, Geometry of Solitons in the notices of the AMS, now 20 years old. It's a beautiful article which relates actions of the loop groups to the so-called Backlund transformation in so for soliton equations. So if you have, uh, say, half an hour time to read, I really recommend going to this uh, to this article. It's more about the PDE um, uh, information you can get out of, of these actions of the loop groups, but it's a nice example of where loop groups naturally turn up in a in a field which might be uh, might seem completely unrelated to infinite dimensional geometry. So, okay, we want to study this loop group now, and uh, actually we want to be doing uh, two things. So, um, so let's uh, so our setting is as always so uh, k. Uh, sorry, okay, k 
was s. So we are looking at the loop group LG for a finite dimensional group G. I'm always, I always want to write a K, but of course it's S1 with values in G, with the point-wise multiplication. And um, uh, let us identify certain interesting subgroups. And the point will be uh, that the uh, subgroups we are concerned will be Lee subgroups of the loop group. Okay, so first of all, we have always a canonical inclusion, let's call it I, of the group into the loop group. And how do we do this? Where well, we send G, so an element in this one, uh, we send it just to the constant map, sending every S in S1 to G. So this is just the constant map. And note uh, that uh, this map, I is a group morphism because we are sending, I mean, because the pointwise operations were used to define the group structure on the loop group. So if I pointwise multiply, uh, then uh, the constant maps this is the same as multiplying first in G. Okay, and um, uh, this, uh, or oh, what we will show that um, the I is smooth, or in other words, a Lie group morphism. And well, and how do we do this? Well, we know, so we have I, G, and now let me write the C infinity functions from S1 with values in G. And we know uh, that the guy on the right hand side is a canonical manifold. Okay, and for canonical, canonical manifolds, we know that uh, I is smooth if and only if the adjoint map I wedge from G times S1 with values in G. Well, and this mapping takes G and an S in S1 and just sends it to G. So this is the projection of G times S1 to G. This is uh, so, and the canonical manifold structure or the inbuilt uh, exponential law for the canonical manifold structure shows that I is smooth if and only if I wedge is smooth. And the smoothness of I wedge is, is clear because projection mappings from direct product of manifolds are smooth. Okay, so we get a Lie group morphism from G and taking values in um, the loop group. And let's, uh, let us now, uh, so recall that uh, for the loop group, we have, what is the tangent bundle of the loop group? Well, it's the tangent bundle of the smooth functions from S1 with values in G. And we can just identify this. So there's this canonical isomorphism taking the tangent bundle to the smooth functions from S1 with values in TG, right? So this was one of the, of the uh, good properties of these, um, of these uh, current groups that we can do this operation. And uh, so uh, under the identification, we see that, uh, so what happens if I take the tangent of this uh, group morphism at some point, let's say at some vector VG, and as always the notation here is, so the VG is an element in the tangent space at G. And it's easy to see now that uh, if we identify uh, the derivative via the above, and via this identification, what we get is, so we can think of the, uh, uh, so uh, we can think of this as, uh, and this is the mapping sending everything to the constant element, k goes to, uh, well, perhaps I should write s because we are now taking elements from s1. So 
uh, we have the console map s gets sent to vg where vg is of course the element in the tangent uh, bundle at the point g and this is an element in the smooth functions from s1 with values in tg and it's constant so this is um, uh, so this map is clearly injective And what this shows us that uh, our mapping I is infinitesimally injective, right? So we have this catalog of properties and if the tangent map at every point uh, is injective, then we call the mapping itself infinitesimally injective. And uh, since G is finite dimensional, this implies that I is an immersion okay so um, we have uh, we have this immersion property and now it becomes perhaps a little bit clearer of why I wanted uh, the group or the target group to be finite dimensional we don't, I mean, this gives us a very easy criterion to show that it's an immersion. So we don't need to construct the immersion charts. That's basically follows now just from this comparatively weak property of being infinitesimally injective, right? And uh, so this is, this is very nice. Uh, of course, if, if, you, if you have an infinite dimension group, you can make a more complicated construction and see, see that it's still an immersion, but okay, we are doing only the finite dimension case here at the moment at the moment and uh, so note however that um, if we evaluate let's say at the unit of s1 uh, so and we compose this evaluation mapping with the in, uh, with this inclusion mapping i what do we get well so if i take a g so the up, uh, this will be evaluated at uh, one, the mapping which sends S to G, so the constant mapping, or in other words, we get G, and this is just the identity on the group G of this. Okay, why have do, uh, did I show you this? So uh, we have seen an exercise. That the evaluation mapping not only at the identity but uh, every evaluation mapping and so in particular the evaluation mapping at the identity of this one from let's see infinity functions well of s1 to g taking various in g this is a lee group morphism so it's smooth and in particular this shows that um, I from G to the image inside of uh, the loop group has a continuous inverse um, on the image. Or in other words, we can say that the I is an embedding. Uh, onto its image. And we now know already, so we, I mean, setting together all this information, we know the eye is smooth, we know the eye is an immersion, we know the eye is a topological embedding onto its image. So this means that the eye is a smooth embedding. And uh, so we haven't discussed embeddings uh, with the same. Uh, uh, in, in the same vein, we have discussed submersions and immersions, but what you can prove is if you have a smooth embedding, this means that the image of uh, I on a G is, uh, in this case, even split submanifold of L G, so this manifold uh, in particular, 
um, we can identify um, G with its image in LG and thus think of the original target group as a Lee subgroup of LG. Right, so we have just seen that uh, well, up to this isomorphism induced by sending uh, sending an element to the constant map, we get an uh, we can we can uh, think of G as sitting inside of the loop group. Okay, um, so this is nice. So uh, basically, G is a Lie subgroup of LG. This is interesting information. And let us now consider the subgroup of LG of all loops starting at the identity element in G, right? So Let's denote this by omega g. And those are all the elements in the loop group, such that f of the identity element is, uh, I mean, the identity element of the of, the, of S1 is the identity element in G. And uh, so, um, by construction. The omega g here is just the pre-image of S1, uh, so of the evaluation in the unit of S1 uh, of the unit of g. So now we can uh, we could play this in, in several different uh, ways. So we could uh, so on one hand we know already that the evaluation map at the unit. So this is a Lie group morphism. And what this shows us is, uh, so we basically see that the omega g is the kernel of the evaluation. Um, well, kernel as a group morphism. So the omega g really is, um, uh, so omega g is a normal subgroup of LG. And uh, furthermore, was also part of the exercises uh, since the evaluation at one point is a submersion. Again, in the exercise, we only prove this for finite dimensional targets. So it's good that we assumed that the group here is finite dimensional. Uh, so what this means is that the omega g is a submanifold. of LG and, uh, and we know if it's a submanifold, which is also a subgroup, uh, this means that the omega G is also a Lie subgroup of uh, the loop group. Okay, and now we can basically sit, uh, set everything together. So uh, from the above discussion, we get the following information. So we can embed omega G injectively as a subgroup of LG. We can then project using the evaluation at the unit to go to G. And we see, I mean, by, by construction, omega G is exactly the kernel of this. So we get an exact sequence in the category of Lie groups. Okay, and we see that actually we have a group morphism here from G to LG, going back that was the I. So this is a splitting sub, um, short exact sequence of um, of Lie groups and uh, so splitting exact 
sequence of uh, Lie groups. And this means, or we can express this in other words, we can, uh, so this means that the loop group actually is isomorphic to a semi-direct product of uh, this normal subgroup omega g, right, semi-direct product with g, right? So uh, basically the group structure of the, of the full loop group is a semi-direct product with respect to, uh, to the subgroups we just identified. And uh, this is, well, depending on what you want to be doing, uh, so this is, can be exploited to learn more, say for example, about the representation theory of the loop group. Okay, and one final thing which I wanted to mention, uh, note that uh, we can use these subgroups to uh, define the fundamental homogeneous space. What is the fundamental homogeneous space? It's basically you take the loop group and quotient out G. So in other words, those are all the equivalence classes H, such that F uh, is in the equivalence class of H if uh, a F can be written as G times H. So we have pointwise product for some G and G, and the meaning is, of course, for the uh, to make sense of this, we identify G actually with the image under I uh, in the loop group. So uh, we have a pointwise product here where the G is uh, supposed to be the constant map sending everything to G. And um, so note um, this principle, uh, this fundamental homogeneous space uh, can be identified as a manifold as uh, uh, the space of base loops. And um, well, so we are basically stopping here at this moment. So I, I should say this fundamental homogeneous space is quite important in the theory of loop groups. It has a very rich structure. You can actually um, sort of uh, look at complex structures on this fundamental homogeneous space and a lot of more information on what to do with this fundamental homogeneous space and why it is important can be found in uh, the book by Presley and Siegel, uh, which is um, aptly named Loop Groups. So this makes uh, so this makes a lot of sense, and then you can use this fundamental homogeneous space to study geometric structures uh, associated to the loop group, right? Uh, unfortunately, I mean we don't have time to really go through uh, all of this material. I just wanted to to present this fundamental homogeneous space as it admits a lot of rich geometric theory, um, which we unfortunately don't have time to go into, right? And um, so. Um, if you want to, um, if you want to know more about this, uh, uh, basically refer to the book by Presley and Siegel, uh, which is called Loop Groups, and this appeared in '86. Right, so if you just Google, you can't miss it. Okay, good. Um, Okay, so um, this is all I wanted to say about the loop groups, which arise by basically restricting from an arbitrary compact manifold to the uh, source to the uh, to the unit circle. And now I want to talk a little bit about gauge groups because they constitute another interesting class of infinite dimensional Lie groups, which are closely connected to the current groups we have here. So let's go back to the slides for a moment. So I want to talk about these gauge groups. The main uh, problem, well, depends a little bit on your background, but uh, I assume that probably many of you haven't seen the definition of a principal bundle. So I first need to define what is a principal bundle to make sense of um, these gauge groups. Okay, and uh, so what is a principal G bundle? So let's assume we have a right Lie group action. So in a, in a way we get this action map which satisfies all the compatibility conditions. Uh, so just recall that, uh, 
So basically what we want to be having is a row of, uh, let's say an E, G, H, is then supposed to be row E, G, uh, sorry, uh, now I will, I'm of course, but I'm messing it up. And then I have to row this. So we have these compatibility conditions with the group product here in the, oops, what happened there? In the component, and so this and this should be a smooth. Uh, so Lie group action means that this mapping is smooth, respects the group structure, and uh, well behaves as expected under uh, multiplication and inversion. And okay, so we take a right Lie group action, and uh, then we assume that the canonical uh, projection mapping with sending e to e mod g is a smooth, locally trivial fiber bundle with typical fiber F. Let me recall what that means. Um, so the meaning of this is, on one hand, well, uh, the mapping should be smooth, so there should be a manifold structure on uh, the target M, so on this quotient. And there should be an open cover, UI of M, and a row equivalent equivariant diffeomorphism and a bundle trivialization, conjugating P to the um, conjugating P to the projection. So the picture is as follows. So you have UI, which sits inside of my manifold M. I have here uh, a mapping P, which is coming from the total space E. And uh, in there, we have the open subset of all points sitting over UI. So you will hear me now uh, speaking a lot about uh, stuff sitting over other things. The reason is basically because um, in this bundle or the, the typical uh, diagram with the bundle has this uh, total space E sitting on top of the base space and we have this mapping P which descends from the total space to the base space and we want uh, this bundle trivialization kappa I to go uh, over here to UI. Oh, I's are missing here, right? Oh. UI times F and you want that in this uh, bundle trivialization, the um, uh, mapping becomes just a projection onto the component UI. And note one thing which uh, you will probably have seen, but if you haven't, then uh, so what do you mean? Uh, what does this row equivariant uh, condition here mean? So the um, so this is uh, important for us, so we have this row equivariance. And it's a little bit, I mean, the, the gauge, uh, the principal G bundle is a little bit like the group equivalent of the vector bundles we have already seen. So uh, notice that um, this uh, equivariance just means that um, if we have um, a group element acting here on, so we have row, of uh, let's say an element p in uh, so I shouldn't I shouldn't write it like this uh, so of an of an element u sitting at uh, over this ui I let the element g act and let's say the u here is kappa i inverse of uh, U I F. So then basically I want that the same thing uh, so that I can take this out. So I can uh, basically conjugate uh, this. So, and instead of looking at this, I have uh, um, an action of uh, G on uh, my elements U I rho I f g notice this looks already uh, i mean why why can i write this down so uh, in this way as we see what this equivariance leads to is that actually nothing is happening here in the uh, component which comes from the from the base space and this is by design so we have we have asked for this project i mean this is the canonical projection map which uh, projects everything uh, from the total space to M and M is the quotient space E mod G.
right? So um, basically the P here is uh, not seeing the action of, of rho. And what this means is that um, in, uh, since the kappa i, so the bundle trivialization, uh, conjugates the p to the projection in the in the first component, we're seeing that in uh, in this trivialized picture, the group action needs to act only on the fiber f of the whole uh, situation, whereas it's not touching the base point, so to speak, in this bundle. Right, so this actually, uh, so we see that in the bundle trivialization, so these fibers F, uh, which correspond under the trivialization to the uh, to the inverse image of, uh, let's say, so what the kappa i is doing, so it's uh, basically establishing an isomorphism between the F and, let's say, um, the P inverse of uh, UI. So this is the fiber. And basically, this whole thing in a trivial bundle is set up that the group action is only acting on the fibers, and you cannot see the group uh, action downstairs on the base manifold M. So again, downstairs means means going down to the base manifold. So this is only acting on the fibers. Okay, so this is a, lo a smooth locally trivial fiber bundle uh, constructed from this group action. And now let's, what is a principal G bundle? So uh, the quadruple of consisting of the total space E, the mapping P, the base space M and the fiber type F, this is a principal G bundle if the action rho is simply transitive. So what this means is if we've taken an element in the fiber, um, then, and, and we restrict the group action to the, uh, uh, so in the, in the left, argument we are setting always as F naught, then we want that this induces a diffeomorphism between the group and uh, the fiber, right? So in this way, uh, the fiber is always diffeomorphic to uh, the Lie group we started with. But in a, uh, so, uh, I mean, you might say that the fiber is, uh, is, just, uh, is just a Lie group. We could just replace it with G. I mean, why, why didn't we replace it with G? Um, so the point here is we want this for each um, element f naught, and um, in a way we get a bunch of diffeomorphisms between the group and uh, and the fiber, right? So for every single element f naught, we we single out we get a in principle different diffeomorphism, though they, in essence this is always the same relating the group to um, the fiber. The reason why one writes out this fiber is um, because we have this bunch of diffeomorphisms, there's, in, there's usually no way to, of a preferred diffeomorphism between G and the fiber. So um, basically, F carries group structures, but the group structure or the, the type of group structure you're getting here, I mean, they are all, always diffeomorphic to G, but there's no preferred choice of uh, the identity. And uh, this situation where you have basically a group which has lost this, its preferred choice of identity, this is called, um, so um, the situation here is called a G torsor. And, um, so we are not going into, into what this means to have a G torsor and, and why it might be natural to not have a group structure, but, uh, but a torsor structure there. Um, Instead, we will um, we will be um, we will uh, we will be looking now into uh, certain diffeomorphisms on the bundle, uh, which then will form something called the gauge group. Right. So, uh, if you want to know more about torsos, uh, John Bass has. Uh, written a nice piece uh, on the web if you're I think it uh, if you're just googling for uh, for torso or something it should come up fairly easily okay so this is a principal g bundle let's see some examples first for the principal principal g bundle where we can always construct the trivial principal bundle by just taking the direct product of a manifold M with a Lie group G, then G acts just by multiplication on the second component. Uh, this is obviously preserving the fibers. And this is the trivial principal bundle. Uh, and well, we get a trivial principal G bundle. 
well, usually one is not interested too much in, in the trivial uh, case. Let me show you a slightly more involved case without the details. So if we have a compact Lie group K and G is a closed subgroup, what we can prove is that the quotient of uh, compact Lie group mod a closed subgroup is again a manifold such that the usual, I mean like uh, the Q, the uh, canonical projection from K onto the uh, onto the quotient space becomes a submersion. And this induces a principal bundle. So we get a principal G bundle, where again, the fiber type is um, of uh, the type K uh, is, is also of, uh, of type G, right? So this is a principal G bundle and this models, I mean, the meaning of this principal bundle is just it models a, uh, homogeneous space. So it's basically a bundle formulation for a homogeneous space. And the final example where I still will not give any uh, details of how this construction works, just in case you have seen it, this is basically for some people who have a little bit of experience in Riemannian geometry, is the frame bundle of a smooth finite dimensional manifold. So uh, when, if the manifold is modeled on Rn, this is then a GLN R principal bundle, but we are not going into this. I don't want to define the frame bundle because we're not needing it. It's just to give you some flavor of example. So in case you have seen the frame bundle, then you uh, know another example of, uh, of a principal bundle, which arises in geometry. Okay, now after seeing the examples, we want to be going to, um, to uh, the so-called gauge groups. So let me define what is the gauge group. So if we have a principal bundle, then we define the gauge group as all the diffeomorphisms of the total space. So E is always uh, uh, referred to as the total space. So we are seeing, we take all the diffeomorphisms on, uh, which satisfy two properties. On one hand, uh, they should be diffeomorphisms which only do something in the fiber direction. So in other words, we are not seeing the diffeomorphism once we project down to the base space. So those are all the bundle automorphisms which are uh, invisible on the base space and only do something on the, uh, on the total space. And there they shift around something in the fibers, for example. Okay, and what we then also want is that um, the uh, we we just call it gauge transformation if it commutes with the group action. So for every element g, we uh, have a group action. We uh, and we want that phi composed with the group action where we have inserted g is the same as the group action composed with phi. And note that this makes sense because of the the first condition we have here tells us that the phi needs to respect the fibers. So if we are starting at a point in a fiber, then the phi may do something to it, but uh, the, res the resulting point will always end up in the same fiber. And by the construction of the gauge bundle, also if we apply a, um, if we apply the group action to something sitting in a fiber, then we always end up with an element which sits in the same fiber. So at least type-wise, this makes sense. And elements in uh, the gauge group are then fittingly called gauge transformation. And the idea is usually that, or I mean, these gauge groups appear naturally in, uh, in physics, where they model a certain degrees of freedom uh, in your physical theory, or at least that can be interpreted in a uh, in certain sense like this. But since we're not doing physics here, I don't want to be going into uh, into the details here. And let's just, um, let's just uh, uh, note something. Uh, so if uh, phi is uh, a gauge transformation, Um, then I can always identify phi of some point E as a rho of E, and then I insert F of E, where F is a smooth mapping from um, E with values in the group G. So when we have a principal G bundle, uh, basically, I mean, the, the reason for this is because we um, know that uh, the phi sends the E, so the E sits inside of some fiber, 
let's say it sits over a point uh, M. So, and the result of, uh, of this thing will also be sitting inside of the same fiber. And now we know that we have a transitive and free group action of G on the fiber. So whatever we get here, uh, so we are sending E to phi of E, which sits in the same fiber. And um, we can always um, uh, think of this as we start at the point E and we are applying a suitable group element to this. And this group element, so this guy is sitting inside of G and this is unique. Uh, so this is inside of PI inverse of M. And um, this group element is uniquely defined by the image of the phi of E, right? And um, so there we will get a smooth mapping from E with values in G, which just gives us a group element by which we have to multiply uh, to get the result of our gauge transformation. Okay, and this is something we want to exploit. So we have uh, basically here the uh, phi is in the gauge group of E, uh, then phi of uh, E is phi, uh, sorry, it's rho. Uh, of E and then we have F of E. So uh, yeah, F was something from E to G smooth. And let's just note, so what happens with this other condition we have in the gauge transformations? So what if we apply uh, F, of, uh, F of rho of E of G? So um, what do we get here? Let's derive a formula. So uh, we know that um, basically we have phi composed with rho uh, of E of G. This is the same as rho of F, uh, sorry, not of F of phi of E applied here the G, right? Okay. And now if we, if we wish to know, so what is, what is the element uh, we're getting here? So on the right hand side, uh, this is the element uh, rho of E. And then I need to apply F, uh, sorry, no, uh, no, I was making, uh, let's see. Ah, uh, so there was, there was a mistake. So this is the, let's see, uh, so we are just, using this formula here. And uh, so we see from this formula, this is rho of rho of EG. And then we have F of rho of EG, right? And now this is a group. Um, and uh, so this is, uh, we are now exploiting that we have a group action. So, uh, on the right hand side here, we get also because of this formula, we get uh, rho of E um, and then we have uh, F of E, right? So, and what does this tell us if we are setting this to, together and we are using that we have a group action so we can write this guy here as rho of E. And now we're multiplying with the element G F of rho of E G. And this should be the same as if we are multiplying um, E with the element F of E. So this gives us a formula because, the, uh, I mean, usually in a group action, you cannot uniquely identify the elements you have uh, you've been multiplying with. But remember, in a principal bundle, uh, so we have a free action. So this means we can, re uh, we can now identify what this means because we have uh, that these two items here, so this needs to be the same as this up there. And we can identify um, the, uh, the element here and what this is, is the following formula. So it's G inverse of F of E 
and then multiplied with g. So if we have a group element, then we uh, then uh, and we want to apply the f to um, row of e g, then we see that we just need to take the usual f of e and we need to conjugate with uh, g inverse and uh, g from the right. All right. So um, and this formula here. Um, so uh, if f comes from a gauge transformation, then f is in the smooth functions from e to g, and f of rho e g equal to g inverse f e g uh, holds for all e in e g in g uh, and let's give this a name in the script in the lecture notes this is 3.7 okay um, so conversely every smooth function f from e to g satisfying 3.7 defines a gauge transformation via the following formula. So we can define phi f. So this will be our gauge transformation. And how do we define it? We define it on the element e as we are applying the action rho to e. And we plug in the value f of e. And uh, what you will be showing is an exercise. Um, one can show that uh, for the following, so we have c infinity from e to g, and then we are denoting here with the g. So uh, what do I mean by this? Those are all the smooth functions from e to g, um, such that for all e in e, g in g, we have f rho e g is equal to g inverse f of e g. So this is exactly the condition where we denote as 3.7. So in a way, this means uh, the c infinity e g with, a, with a, an upper uh, index g. Those are all the um, those are all the uh, smooth functions that are equivariant or which conjugate the uh, action of G on E to the conjugation action on G, right? And uh, so we, we have this space of, in a way, equivariant functions with respect to these two actions. So uh, e is, uh, G is acting via rho on E and G is also acting on itself using the conjugation. And uh, so uh, show that for this space, the following map. So we take these equivariant functions and take them to the gauge group. And the assignment is where well, we just take an f and um, take this to phi of f and uh, where the phi of f is defined as above. So phi of f of e is rho e f of e so that this is a group isomorphism. What do I mean by this? Note uh, that the group structures are given as follows. Well, sort of the gauge group of E, this sits inside of the diffeomorphism group of E. So, and becomes subgroup. Um, uh, so the group 
product is uh, composition. And the C infinity from E to G, now with G, uh, this sits inside of the current group, E to G, so with uh, pointwise operations. And now the plot thickens, as, as we can think. So um, we have this we have this group isomorphism. I mean, this is a computation which is tedious but not hard. And uh, we can thus identify the gauge group of a bundle uh, using this uh, this bijection as the subgroup. C infinity E G G. Now this is a subgroup of the current group from E to G, right? And and this is the reason why we are studying a little bit this current group. Uh, this is this gauge group in in the setting of current groups, so they become naturally uh, subgroups of the current groups. Um, so one thing one should say about this. Um, on one, I mean, the methods we had in the in the lecture were a little bit restricted. So we only get a Lie group structure here if the right, uh, if the space or this total space on the light, uh, right hand side is compact. So we have a Lie group structure on the current group if the right hand uh, if the if the source space is compact. This is very restrictive, as you might uh, as bundles are in general not uh, not such that the total space is compact, right? So we will in general have non-compact total spaces of bundles. However, at least in one of these examples we have been looking at, so uh, um, so this happens naturally. in uh, the homogeneous space example, where you have uh, K sitting over K mod G. Uh, so, and this was compact. So we have a compact Lie group where we have quotiented out something. So at least there are some examples which we can treat with the somewhat restricted theory. Of course, you can construct um, and under suitable assumptions, you can construct uh, some current group structures on the uh, on stuff with non-compact domain, and also you can turn these gauge groups into Lie groups. So it actually turns out under suitable assumptions that uh, the gauge group um, is uh, so under suitable assumptions. We are not just going to discuss them here. Uh, one can show that uh, the gauge group becomes uh, a Lie subgroup of. Um, actually, I'm, I'm uh, skipping here some technical details. Uh, so. Uh, Actually, the uh, as always, the, the story is a little bit more complicated. So it becomes a Lie subgroup of a uh, finite product of uh, current groups. This is mostly, or at least in the Bastiani setting, these results are due to Christoph Wockel in I think his PhD thesis was uh, where this was developed. Okay. However, uh, so we are we are not going to uh, to prove this. There are some references in the lecture notes of where you can find more information about this. So gauge groups at least can be an, on the on the group level identified with subgroups of current groups, and uh, this is why gauge groups nicely fit into this chapter. Uh, whereas the usual interest in gauge groups is because they appear. Uh, uh, in physics, for example, and also in other applications, so they are of their own interest. Uh, let me let me give you uh, one more. Uh, let me give you some more examples on gauge groups. So if um, so, if uh, we have the trivial bundle, mm.
what do we get then? Um, well, basically, it's not hard to see since, uh, uh, I mean, basically, because it's a trivial bundle, we have that the gauge group of uh, this bundle is just uh, or can just be identified by dropping the first uh, first component uh, to so this becomes just the whole current group so there's no restriction here um, so if m is compact we know how to uh, construct a Lie group structure. for the gauge group. Of course, this is sort of the boring example if you want, um, since usually, I mean, the principal bundles one wants to be looking at is um, uh, is not, um, well, is, is not a, uh, is, is not a principle, uh, is not a trivial bundle. Okay, and oh, why, should, why did I write A here? So actually, uh, so this is the only example we are doing. So um, bas basically, I'm, I'm not going to identify uh, more gauge groups here. So in, in general, this is more of an, uh, let's say a more complicated uh, problem of um, building uh, infinite dimensional Lie group structures on the, on the gauge groups. Let me just, as a final remark, so, uh, note the following. So we have all the automorphisms of the bundle. So not only the ones which we, we cannot see on the, uh, on, so if E, P, M, F is a principal G bundle. So then we obviously have a morphism from all the so uh, from all the bundle automorphisms of E. So uh, going down to the diffeomorphism group, and what it does is basically we, are, we have here post composition with the projection. So the the bundle automorphisms are um, uh, uh, basically the elements in the diffeomorphism group which respect this uh, this bundle structure of, of the principal bundle we have here on the total space. Okay, and so we, uh, uh, well, ah, shouldn't write it like this because that would imply surjectivity. So in general, you are not, or it depends a little bit on what the, manif or the, what the manifold M is, but in general, we are not getting everything in the diffeomorphism group, but the image um, of uh, the P star is in general an open subgroup of uh, diff M containing the identity. And the kernel, however, of this, I mean, the P star is a, turns out to be a group morphism. And if you uh, invest a little bit of work, you can turn these bundle automorphisms of E also into a Lie group. And the point here is the kernel of this P star is actually the gauge group of E. So here we can actually prolong this. Uh, so we have just the inclusion of the gauge group into all the bundle automorphisms. And what you, what you can show, again, since I have not told you how to build the Lie group structure on the automorphism group, is also that uh, this whole situation presents the automorphism group of the bundle as so odd E becomes a Lie group extension of uh, uh, the open uh, subgroup. Let's give this open subgroup here a name. Let's call this uh, open subgroup G0. So the open subgroup G0 of the diffeomorphism group with the gauge group. This is well known. While we are not doing any uh, um, 
any structure theory in this regard or analyze the situation further, I thought it's an interesting piece of information that we have uh, this group extension in this setting. Okay, and uh, this is actually everything I wanted to tell you about the gauge groups and the Lie groups for today.